This week on Talk to Al Jazeera, the troubled country of Somalia faces a new crisis, political deadlock. I'm James Bowes at UN headquarters in New York. After 30 years of chaos and conflict, this was going to be a pivotal year for Somalia. There was supposed to be the first one person, one vote elections in 50 years. However, in September, that plan was abandoned, replaced with indirect elections for Parliament in December and then for the President on February the 8th. Neither happened. Now the official time in office of President Mohamed Abdullahi Formaggio has come to an end and without political agreement, opposition leaders have declared Formaggio's government illegitimate. So what next for Somalia? Will the government remain in office or will there be a power vacuum? We'll explore Somalia's escalating electoral crisis in depth as the country's foreign minister, Mohamed Abdurazak, talks to Al Jazeera. Mohamed Abdurazak, foreign minister of Somalia, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera at a time that appears to be a crisis for Somalia. It's a time when there were supposed to be presidential elections. They haven't happened. Can you tell me whether the government you represent is now illegitimate? Thank you for having me. Um, the government we have is legitimate. Our constitution stipulates that uh, the Somali government is uh, essentially and practically a parliamentary system. Uh, it's a mix, but it is a parliamentary system. And the parliament has a mandate of four years. Um, after the parliament is elected, it elects a president who then appoints a prime minister, who then appoints a cabinet. And in that system, it starts with the parliament. So the parliament is sort of the mother of our governance system. The parliament's mandate was supposed to run out on December 27th of last year. But um, over the course of the last three and a half years, the federal government of Somalia has tried to have an election, uh, design an election that was supposed to be a one person, one vote, which then uh, did not occur, uh, mainly due to the uh, refusal of some of our mem federal member states. Um, but um, the political process and the federal government's uh, dialogue due to uh, it is uh, acceptance of um, conditions set by uh, those federal member states, this process continued. And finally, on September 17, last year, the federal government and the federal member states signed an agreement that would not be a one person, one vote, but a, an indirect election system, close to the one we had in 2016. Understood. But that indirect election was supposed to take place on February the 8th. The election no. has not taken place. And I've looked at the Constitution of Somalia, Article 91. The President of the Federal Republic shall hold office for a term of four years, starting from the day he takes office, takes the oath uh, as the President. Well, after that time, after that four years, he is no longer legitimately no. the President. Uh, is there he? cannot be a vacuum. The Federal Parliament in both chambers have signed, uh, voted for, uh, by a majority of 215 in the lower house and 40 senators to have a, a law that would allow for the parliament with its full authority to continue with its mandate and for all the institutions of the federal government to continue. So we have a law and uh, that law allows uh, for the, both the federal parliament and the federal government to continue until an election is organized. Now, you cannot have it both ways. You cannot have a situation where the federal member states and the, all the others are refusing to go to an election, but at the same time uh, saying that the time has run out. Elections have to take place. 
Well, well we that, is, that is what they are saying. The, the opposition has issued office. a statement saying that President Formaggio's term has ended and they're now calling for the is... formation of a transitional national council. What do you no, make of that No, but that's half call? the truth. It's not the whole truth. Yes, the president's term is four years, the parliament's term is four years, but also there is a law that does not allow for a vacuum to take place. And, and, and that is the full truth. And in order for, that, for there to be a, a political transition, there has to be an election. How worrying do you believe this situation is? I spoke recently to the current president of the UN Security Council. Uh, currently, the UK holds the presidency. Ambassador Barbara Woodward told me not holding polls will increase the risk to security and stability in Somalia. The position of the federal government of Somalia is that we want to have an election. The federal government of Somalia wanted to have this election organized worked on, a model agreed on for the last three and a half years. And that hasn't happened. But what the federal government wants is an election uh, that is inclusive, not a partial one, an election that is transparent, an election that all the people who are eligible to vote and who can participate in elections to, to participate. But the fact of the matter is that the federal government has been asking and has been trying to have an election organized uh, for quite some time. All the delays, it is as a result of the federal member states. Well, we'll come in a moment to their problems that they have with the election and their complaints, their dispute about the election. But just to be clear, you said there can't be a partial election. That's the position, too, of the international community. Can you confirm that they talk about any alternative outcomes, including a parallel process or partial uh, election would be a setback? Can you confirm that your administration, your government, will not consider anything other than a, than a full election? The federal government of Somalia is charged and has been, uh, we have a president who has been elected legally by the federal member, federal parliament of Somalia and, and a government uh, that has been given the vote of confidence by the federal parliament of Somalia that is charged with the responsibility of organizing an election. And that government's desire is to have an election that is inclusive, fair uh, and transparent. Let me talk to you about this election because a prominent person, no less than the chairperson of the National Independent Electoral Commission, Halima Ibrahim, has described what you're planning as a selection, not an election. This isn't a proper election, even that, that you're planning. It's, um, it's an indirect election. Isn't it a bit of an indictment of the administration that you represent, that's been in power for four years, that it hasn't come to a position where it can hold a one-person, one-vote election? Absolutely not. And let me share uh, something with you. That um, about three and a half years ago, I became uh, an advisor to the president on elections and democratization. And since then, we have included all federal government relevant institutions, as well as the federal member states, to design an election that would be a one person, one vote, that would ensure uh, the meaningful and full participation of women, at least to a 30 percent. Uh, and that model uh, has been rejected by the federal member states. So it is not true to say that the federal government did not want to have a one person, one vote. It is the others who wanted to have uh, an election that is indirect election. And now uh, it is the truth. In order to avoid a vacuum, uh, this is what they have negotiated. A 17, it's called the 17th September Agreement which they again refuse to but implement. But do you, accept, do you accept that if you have an election under that agreement, it'll be similar to previous elections in Somalia? And I quote from Abdul Rashid Hashi, who's the director of the most prominent think tank in Somalia, the Heritage Institute of Policy Studies, about the last time you had an election like this, an indirect model. He said it was very flawed. The corruption was beyond description. There was no fair competition. There was no oversight. Conflict of interest was rife and horror stories were reported across 
the regions. What, you, what is being planned now is bound to be flawed. Uh, and James, not? that election that you just described was organized and held by the previous government. So we should not be indicted on the basis of the performance of the previous government. Uh, but what, 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 but what uh, 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 the analyst is saying is that the, that election, uh, the design of it, it is, is very similar to what uh, we're going to be doing, which is what the federal member states have agreed to. This is what they wanted, that the government has uh, conceded, accommodated their uh, uh, request. Well, what the federal member states, particularly Jubaland and Puntland and opposition leaders say they're unhappy with is the implementation committees for the election. They claim that President Formaggio has installed loyalists on the polling committees and stacked them with members of the intelligence agency, civil servants and supporters. This is the practice that all previous uh, governments have done in terms of, of organizing election committees. What is true is that President Mohamed Abdullahi Formaggio went in front of parliament on February 6th and, and, and confirmed to the whole world that he had only two requests. One was to preserve the National Independent Electoral Commission and to have a 30% women's representation and both were rejected. This is what we need to tell the world. This is what everybody needs to know and all Somalis need to know. The leaders of Jubaland and Puntland say that there is a pattern here of President Formaggio trying to destroy the federal power structure. What do you say to that? What I would say is that in Somalia, um, we have a process of federalization, which has not been uh, all agreed on, uh, which is in the process. Our constitutional review and finalization process is well underway. And these things take time. And in that process, uh, Somalia and Somalis have to figure out what is the best way to go about federalizing Somalia. It's not the best time to be uh, debating the future of the country in terms of its federalism and all of these important questions in an election cycle and in the midst of what's supposed to be uh, an election period. As we look at tensions in the federal system in Somalia. It's worth reminding our viewers there's one piece of territory, very large piece of territory, that's nominally under the control of Mogadishu, but is a de facto state in itself. Somaliland has its own army, police, currency, politicians. It has its own elections as well. It has all the trappings of a state. Is it not time now for a lasting settlement between Somalia and Somaliland? Um. This government, uh, the federal government of Somalia, has uh, continued uh, to have uh, a, a dialogue uh, with the Somaliland uh, administration, um, in the last of which was uh, uh, this in 2020 in, in Djibouti. Uh, the talks uh, have not uh, produced any fruits, but it will continue in Somalia will under no circumstances give up on its territorial uh, integrity, uh, sovereignty and political independence. The current tensions in your country just play into the hands of Al-Shabaab, do they not? Tell me about Al-Shabaab. How strong is it now? Al-Shabaab, um, as we all know, is uh, an enemy of the Somali people, um, an enemy that has over, over the years continued to change and adapt. Um, but um, an enemy that uh, currently uh, is not uh, an existential threat uh, to the federal government of Somalia or the Somali state. I think the option of um, having a, a military and in the battlefield is very important. Uh, and that will continue for the foreseeable uh, future. But when the time is right, uh, when there's uh, uh, the opportunity is, is you know, uh, right uh, for negotiations. Uh, we will see when that comes. But right now, from what we see, uh, we would have to continue to protect our people, protect our borders, uh, and protect our state. 
AMISOM, the African Union force, which numbers about 20,000 uniformed personnel, is supposed to slowly draw down and eventually leave the country and hand over to the Somali security forces. Is that handover really going to happen? Right now, the mandate of AMISOM is coming to an end, um, and uh, we expect that uh, to be uh, uh, renewed in the coming weeks. Um, but we want to have the basis of moving forward to be the Somali transitional plan, which calls for uh, a number of uh, steps that will enhance uh, such a transition. The recent report by the US Inspector General to Congress talked about your own Somali security forces. It says they continue to rely on international support for operations and Al-Shabaab is not degraded to the point where Somali security forces can contain its threat independently. It went on, further details about the Somali security forces operational capabilities are not publicly releasable. They don't want to say uh, the, the extent of the problem there publicly, but it's true that your forces aren't up to the job yet, are they? Well, it's unfortunate that the report and others who talk about uh, the Somali National Army do not talk about the fact that we're still a country that is under arms embargo and that um, we don't have the, the capability to equip uh, our, our um, troops. And, um, and as long as that is the case, uh, I think we will continue to need uh, some support uh, from our friends in the fight against terrorism and instability. When you talk about your friends, you talk about AMISOM, you've also got an EU training mission in Somalia, about 200 strong. You did have another important force there training uh, the Somali security forces and helping with their operations. That was US troops, and yet those US troops, 700 of them, have all been pulled out uh, by the United States, by the Trump administration. They had all left by January. Was it a mistake of the Trump administration to pull out those forces? It is true. The uh, U.S. troops have been uh, pulled out and um, relocated, rather, or repositioned um, from the, across the border into neighboring countries. Um, and, uh, but that doesn't change uh, the uh, operations, uh, security operations, the joint security operations uh, in Somalia. You were on a recent trip to the United States, you must be quite glad to see the back of the Trump administration. Not only did they pull out the troops, you had the Trump travel ban. Somalia was on the list of Islamic and African countries that couldn't come to the US. And you'll remember uh, President Trump himself used that vulgar language to describe African countries. Is your government and the people of Somalia glad to see Donald Trump is no longer in the White House? The federal government of Somalia has uh, strong an historical relationship with the government of the United States. And uh, we are happy that uh, there is now a new administration that we hope um, soon we will sit down and uh, review our uh, bilateral relations, uh, common interest, and, and continue uh, to, into the future. Let's look at relations with your neighboring countries and let me start with Ethiopia because clearly an alarming situation in Tigray just across the border. The new US Secretary of State Antony Blinken has described it as, uh, as having grave concern when he spoke to Ethiopia's uh, Prime Minister Abe Ahmed. Um, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said he was seriously concerned and the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights Michelle Bachelet says it's extremely worrying and volatile situation is spiraling out of control. She says there's uh, corroborated information of gross human rights violations and abuses. How worried are you about what's going on in Tigray and what the uh, Ethiopian forces backed, we, we hear probably by Eritrean forces, are doing there? The Somali government and the Ethiopian uh, government have a very strong um, mutually respectful uh, relationship. Um, according to the African Union uh, uh, Constitutive Act, uh, we are prohibited about talking about the internal affairs of a sisterly country. Uh, what is going on in Ethiopia is uh, something that uh, 
should be asked the, the Ethiopian uh, government. We have our hands uh, but in sure, some But other. surely uh, you, 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 you're not being silenced by the African Union if you want to speak out about gross human rights abuses. Absolutely not. That must be an issue of concern. That must be an issue of concern for you. Or are you worried because there are uh, many reports that your predecessor was sacked uh, because of comments calling uh, for dialogue in Tigray? Absolutely not. Um, it is a matter of choice. Um, and uh, no one is silencing us. I'm talking to you with uh, all the freedoms that I have. Um, but it is a practice. Uh, we are complaining about internal, uh, you know, political interferences. Uh, so we do not want to be also aggressors and talk about other countries' internal affairs. What about the reports of Eritrean forces also operating in Tigray? Uh, that seems to be confirmed. Uh, State Department officials will tell you it privately. So will UN officials. Look, um, I, I would have to believe when the Tigrayans um, uh, speak, I would have to take it for their word. When the Ethiopians say something about what's going on in Ethiopia, I take them for their word. So you believe the words of Eritrea and Ethiopia. Let me move to another neighbour. Kenya. Um, there, your government has been more forthright about its problems with Kenya. You even cut diplomatic ties for a time at the end of last year. Explain why there are so many problems with Kenya when it's a place of refuge for so many years for Somalis. Even you yourself used to be a resident there. I see you did your research very well. Yes, I did live in, in Kenya, but it is also true that we've had um, violations uh, of both our territorial integrity and sovereignty and political independence uh, from, from Kenya. These are documented, a list that is long, and uh, the federal government of Somalia has, in the last three plus years, uh, has tried to address these issues uh, bilaterally with the uh, Kenyan uh, government. Um, and uh, have fallen in deaf ears. Um, we were left well, no you say, choice. You say, but you say to... that, and you say, and you say, you say that Somalia also um, listens to uh, bodies its members of. IGAD, the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, which is the regional body, sent a fact-finding mission and ex exonerated Kenya from allegations of violating Somalia's sovereignty. Um, I can tell you that uh, IGAD. Uh, uh, fact-finding mission, uh, which was mainly uh, Djibouti, was a frivolous report, embarrassingly frivolous report, and everyone knows it. Um, the fact-finding mission was invited to come to Somalia, which they did, and that was their first trip. They were supposed to go to Kenya and go to the border area, talk to the people on the ground, uh, which they did not. They were supposed to come back and talk to the Minister of Defense, talk to the Minister of Aviation, talk to other relevant ministries, interview people. That has not happened. When you look at the situation for ordinary Somalis, it's alarming. You've got COVID-19, desert locusts, drought. You're still suffering also from the effects of flash flood flooding from November's uh, cyclone. Are you worried that, you know, a few years ago, I remember there was a London conference in 2012, one in 2017, that perhaps Somalia, despite these problems, is slipping off the international agenda? The reason why Somalia remains um, on the agenda, the international agenda, is uh, the fact that we are raising uh, hope that uh, we are ending uh, 30 years of lawlessness and no government. And this government has embarked on a series of reforms, uh, and security reform. For the first time, you have a Somali National Army that has a biodata registration, that has their weapons registered, that are getting regular salaries, that have their structure, and that are fighting al-Shabaab. This gives the international community and partners hope. We have also set on um, political reforms, um, which is, I think, the, the hardest part right now because of uh, the uh, still the Constitution is under review and the fact that elections are not taking place on time. But 
because of this series of reforms and achievements, Somalia is raising the hopes that a country like Somalia can turn the corner. And that is why uh, the, our partners in the world has not given up on us. Do you really have such high hopes? As you say, it's 30 years since the end of a dictatorship. That's now meant three decades of conflict, chaos and turmoil. And you paint a positive picture, but you're now facing a major political crisis. This, I have been um, working uh, with the Somali government and with the international uh, organizations working on Somalia for the last 21 years. And um, I have never been more hopeful now than at any time in the past two decades. Uh, and that I say from experience, that I say from uh, what we're seeing and what we're doing and seeing it. Um, but uh, uh, the Somali people will be able to tell their story. Mohamed Abdurazak, the foreign minister of the federal government of Somalia, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. Thank you. Welcome.